כן, גוד שבס, אין חג שמח, אין חודש טוב. All these things in one. Right? If we had three Torah schools, we would have taken out all three Torah schools today. There's a reading for Rosh Kodesh, there's a reading for Hanukkah, and there's a reading for Shabbat as well. All right, so this week's parasha is called Miketz, uh, and it starts off by saying at the end of two years, and that's obviously talking about the two years that Joseph was in prison. And uh, many of our sages look at this and say the name Miketz, there's got the word Ketz in it. What does Ketz mean? Ketz means the end. So when they look at this parasha, they say we should be watching and reading this parasha, to see what it's going to be like at the end of days when this world finally comes to an end. Now, how many of you ever experienced something that felt like it was the end of your world? <laughs> I felt that this week. I felt the most suffering that I felt in my life yesterday morning when I went to go pull this tooth. And it's not just me, there's many others in our congregation as well. For example, Sarah's not here today. How many teeth did she pull? All four wisdom teeth. Ah, she burned your prayers as well. I pulled my front molar. Did you also get to get someone here? There was someone else that went. But he chickened out. The car stopped. You got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bullet there. So I went this week and I pulled a tooth as well. And by the way, Rebecca's also going to go Monday morning. She's going to go pull three of her wisdom teeth as well. So it seems to be a thing. Pulling teeth this week in our community. So today I want to chat a little bit about it because I had an absolutely horrid and horrible week with pain from this tooth that got pulled. I actually went on Monday morning with the hope that I'd be fine by Shabbat. It didn't bother me when it comes to Shabbat. So I went on Monday morning and um, she pulled a tooth and uh, obviously that was horrible. But this tooth that I've got that I got pulled is a tooth I've been struggling with for years. Even Dr. Franz has been looking after it for years on end. I've had um, fillings, I'm pointing at the camera, not that way. Let's see if it was That's not Dr. Francho, I know. I've had fillings upon fillings. I've had root canals on this tooth. About three years ago, I eventually got something called the apisectomy. They go through the bone, they cut through the bone, then cut the tip off of the roots and seal it up again. By the way, if you want to be very squirmish, maybe now is a good time to close your ears. So I did that three years ago. And now eventually it still wasn't coming right. So the dentist told me I must come and we must pull that entire tooth out because the tooth itself, after the last scan we did of it, the tooth started eating itself from the bottom up. Can you believe that? That's how hungry my teeth were. It started eating itself up and started making like an abscess underneath the tooth. And because of that, this tooth became a danger to my other teeth around it. It could end up infecting it and start eating the other teeth around it. So we needed to pull this tooth and get it out, which that in itself is a horrible thing. But I thought I'd be fine by today. But yesterday I had to go back to the dentist because my, um, when you pull a tooth, the blood is supposed to make like a little, uh, what's it called? A clot, a blood clot, right? The clot came out as well. So the pain was just increasing and increasing. So I had to go back yesterday and try to squeeze in. And what she did was she had to grind down my bone even more so that some more of the sinews could bleed and make a new clot. Fantastic. So yes, I have had one of the worst weeks in my life with all the pain that I've been going through. So yes, today I'm standing before you heavily medicated. That's the only way I'm able to stand here before you. And I'm extremely grumpy as well. Ask Rebecca how I've been this week. She's been living with a lion with a full tooth this week. And what's even more, making me even more grumpy is that now that I'm old, first time I've pulled a tooth, in my old age, that I can remember of, there's no tooth fairy anymore. Even in Hanukkah, I get nothing for the tooth being pulled. So it's just been downhill all the way. So in it, it feels for me, yeah, please, it doesn't help me much, but anyway, thank you for the compassion. <laughs> so I was looking at this and the fact that so many of us in the community have had tooth problems this week. I decided to look at this week for a shot and go read up some of the Midrashim and specifically look for a story about teeth in our parasha. And I did it long and hard, I can tell you what, there's not much going on with teeth in this week's parasha. But I eventually found something in the Midrash Tanchuma, which I'm now renaming the Midrash Tanchuma. In the Midrash Tanchuma, uh, I found an interesting little Midrash that tells us about what, con uh, what conspired down there in Egypt when the brothers came to Joseph in disguise. So let's sink our feet into this Midrash. So it tells us the background story. Remember, the brothers came down there and they still didn't know who Joseph was. And Joseph eventually says, where's your younger brother? Benjamin will stay home. So he said to them, no, you guys will go back and fetch your youngest brother, Benjamin, and come stand all of you here before me. Because of course he wanted to fulfill the dream that he had 
of all 11 stars buying down to him, all 11 grains buying down to him, right? So he wanted all the brothers there. But what did he do? He kept one behind, right? Who did he keep behind? Simeon, Shimon, how do you want to pronounce it? He kept Shimon behind. He practically kidnapped Shimeon and kept him behind. So the Midrash tells us this is how it happened. Once the brothers left and Simeon was there, Joseph called 10 of Pharaoh's mightiest men to come and arrest Simeon. And when they came to Simeon, what did he do? He Chuck Norris them. <laughs> Knocked them out. Gone. So what does Joseph do? He calls 70 more of Pharaoh's mightiest men. And eventually when they come there, he realizes it's outnumbered. He's not going to be able to Chuck Norris them. So what does he do? The Midrash says, Shimeon gave off a mighty roar, like a lion. And as he roared at them, all 70 of them passed out, collapsed, fell, and all of them broke their teeth. It's a cool power, hey? Come here, come here. The lion's the roar. Hey? That's the Midrash. That's the Midrash. So I looked at this and I thought to myself, you get a lesson out of this. And I thought to myself, long and hard, and I realized, no, there's no lesson in this. So I continued reading the Midrash. This is a different lesson. comes up with the rest of the story. So as this was happening, Joseph's sons, what are their names? Well done. If you forgot, it would be fine because one guy's name is forgetful. So that's okay to forget their names. Forgetful and fruitful are their names. Like Ephraim and Manasseh. So uh, Manasseh, seven years old at that time, was watching this going on. First of all, he defeats the 10 gods, and then he defeats the 70. What does Manasseh do? Seven years old. He stands up, walks up to his unknown to him, his uncle, walks up to his uncle Simon, and punches him, knocks him out cold. Simon is down. So they put the, you know, the, they put the, the chains on him, and they lead him to the prison. Knocks him out six love, the seven-year-old. When Simon eventually wakes up in the Midrash, he is absolutely astonished. He says the following. Listen to this. This is where the lesson comes. He says, that hit must have come from my father's house. That's what he says. So what does this mean? So our commentators come along with this Midrash and they explain it as follows. They say that the nation of Israel, the 12 tribe, the 12 descendants of Jacob, they knew that they could not fall or falter under the punishment of any other nation on earth because... God made the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to protect them. They would never be done away with. They would be, it would be an eternal covenant. But when he got knocked out by this little kid, he realized that it's not another nation that knocked him out. It was, in fact, one of his own brothers. Therefore, Manasseh must be somehow part of his family. He must be a fellow Israelite. And there's a far-reaching lesson that we can learn from this Midrash. Because sometimes the biggest blow that we can take in life, the biggest punch, the biggest suffering, Right? suffering that we can go through comes from within our own tribe to speak from within our own home because that is also a lesson that we learn during this festival the festival of Hanukkah because Hanukkah we all know the generic reason uh, of why we celebrate Hanukkah and the miracle that happened right there was the miracle of the oil that lasted for eight days long but why was the temple desecrated in the first place do we concentrate on that not so much we just have lights and we have delicious food Gamble a bit with the dreidel and the chocolate money, but not so often do we actually go and study the story of what happened in Hanukkah. Why did it happen to us? Why was the temple desecrated? Is it all Antiochus's fault, or is someone else also to blame for what happened to us in those years, many, many years ago? Because if you look at the other tyrants that the Jews have had to face in history, like, for example, Haman and uh, Hitler, their goal was to immediately just exterminate the Jews, kill the Jews. Antiochus, however, he wasn't interested in killing the Jews. He was running the system where he realized that through the power of, let's call it the power of, Hellenism or secularization, what they did then was they would go to nations, secularize them or Hellenize them, follow Greek culture, and then they would have an even larger, um, even larger kingdom with people that think the same, look the same, smell the same, talk the same, and behave the same. So this is what they did. Their secret weapon was not to kill the enemy, but it was to Hellenize the enemy and turn them into Greeks themselves. Very clever way of fighting a war. That is how you hit them where it really hurts. If you can hit them from within. Just like we read about in this Midrash, right? And what's very sad is that for the story of Hanukkah, many, many, many Jews fell for this trick. They were in love with Hellenism. There's a lot to love about Greek culture. It was uh, mathematics. 
for those who are ultra religious, they can go study with all the all these Yiddishes, the Yiddishes, and all these guys with their philosophies, right? The philosophers. There was a lot of good that came from the Greek culture I and mean, Hellenism, and Jews actually fell for it, and they fell in love with Hellenism so much so that eventually it was actually the Jews ourselves, it was us who are responsible for our very temple's desecration. Because who do we always blame for sacrificing the pig in the temple? We blame Antiochus. Did Antiochus go and do it? No, it was a Hellenistic Jew who went into our own temple and defiled our temple by offering his bacon and cheeseburger on not our altar, but an altar to Zeus. A Hellenistic Jew did this. We always blame Antiochus, we blame the Greeks, but we ourselves have got problems. Because if you study the story even more and do a little bit of the background of the history of Hanukkah, you'll learn that we had a pretty good high priest back then. His name was Hani. He was a high priest in charge. But then he had a brother whose Hebrew name by chance was Yeshua. And this brother of his became Hellenized. He loved this Greek culture so much so that he no longer wanted to be called Yeshua. He said, from now on, you shall call me Jason. And this Jason, who was the brother of the high priest, he eventually went and wingo wangled his way into the high priesthood by buying and bribing Antiochus. So we had our very first Hellenistic high priest in charge with Jason. But if he could do it, why couldn't someone else? Eventually, some other Jews, Hellenistic Jews, that weren't even from the tribe of Levi, bribed it away from him. You know what it's like. Once you start buying a bribe, the biggest bribe wins, ne? So some other guys from the tribe of Benjamin eventually bought the priesthood and they were in charge and they were Hellenistic. So they did nothing religious while they were our um, high priests in the temple. So much so that when they actually had to pay up their bribe to Antiochus, they didn't have the money. So what did they do? They sold the temple's golden utensils to make money to pay for the bribe so that they could stay high priest. How corrupt isn't that? So it's not that we always look at the wicked Greeks and blame the wicked Greeks in Hanukkah. We also need to think about the fact that we had wicked brothers among us as well. So the rededication of the temple that we do celebrate every year in Hanukkah isn't only about the victory over Antiochus and the Greek army, but it should also inspire us to pursue victory over the weapon that they used, secularism, Hellenism, going in with the public, fading away. That is something that we should also be fighting because that is in fact the enemy within our gates. That is the rotten tooth in our very own mouths. And that rotten tooth, unfortunately, has the potential to make all the other teeth rotten as well, just like the rotten apple in the basket story. So the Midrash teaches us the same thing that we, sp that we spoke about, that Shimon realized, after his death, he gave him the uppercut, he realized that our biggest enemy, our biggest threat is among ourselves. We and each other, we can do to each other more damage than anyone else can actually do to us from the outside. So we need to use Hanukkah to keep our religious flames burning and realize that pain and suffering is not always inflicted at the hand of a tyrant from far, far away. Many times we inflict it upon ourselves or towards each other. And similarly, in the New Testament, we read about the same thing. Paul warns us, for example, in a communal setting, some of his pastoral letters, he writes, if someone in your community is promoting things like Hellenism and all these horrible things, you should do what with them? Excommunicate them. Like pulling a tooth, he says, you must take them out of your congregation. Yeshua says about your, the body, right? We are all part of one body, right? Some teeth need to be pulled every now and then. What does he say? If your eye causes you to sin, you shall gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, you shall chop it off. What do you think he would have said about your tooth? Your tooth causes you to sin, you would say, pull it out. And it's very funny, if you look at Hanukkah, Hanukkah has become the most secular of all the holidays. Even of the minor festivals, it's much more secular than the other ones. It's literally turned into Jewish Christmas. What's the focus of Hanukkah nowadays? Latkes, oily food, gout, chocolate, money, sufkan yot, donuts with jelly inside. What do these things cause you? Toothache. That is where our focus is today. And count. <laughs> so a lesson from the Midrash for us today from Hanukkah is to let us use these last days of Hanukkah to kindle, to reignite that flame, that fire inside ourselves, to hold on to our religion, to practice traditions with meaning, 
not just do it superficially, because what we're doing is we are secularizing ourselves. Look at our families, look at our friends, make sure that we don't fall into that trap. Because the enemy within, that one tooth that you don't want to pull because you're too scared to go to the dentist, needs to get pulled out in your life to make sure that every other aspect of your life is still intact. And if you don't do this, if you don't pull this tooth, then it will literally feel the rest of your life like pulling teeth, which is not pleasant. So let's sort that out. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.